It's felt like forever since we did our last top 10 video, so I'm really excited to bring you this one. With the holiday festive season and a bit of laziness from Riot, we jumped directly from patch 1.6 to patch 2.0. Even after all this time, we got a very minor nerf to the Go Hard archetype, and it decided to leave Grand Plaza and Zoe unchanged, which are really present in the higher tiers of ranked right now. We also see the same decks over and over every single expansion like Draven Ezreal, Fiora Shen, Discard Aggro, all those kind of decks. But with that said, a lot of time has passed and there's also been obviously the minor change to pack your bags, so expect some changes from the previous top 10. This is Top 10 Decks Patch 2.0. This video has been done in collaboration with Bomber TV. Please remember to like and subscribe and turn on the bell notifications too, so let's dive in. Callista Elise is basically a mono Shadow Isles deck with the exceptional free copies of Pale Cascade. It's an aggro deck and has a typical low average mana cost with all the cards but two copies of the Harrowing costing four or less mana. It's fairly cheap with 23 common cards in total. As one of the main counters to one of the most popular decks at the moment, Go Hard, we still see this having a dominant part of the meta. It's sad having counter decks in a top 10 list but it shows how controlling the Go Hard archetypes was and still is even with the Pack Your Bags nerf. This deck is very interesting. The reason why we go Mono Shadow Isles is so we can activate Wraith Cooler more consistently. Wraith Cooler has the Allegiance effect to summon a Mist Wraith. Allegiance only activates when the top card in your deck matches this card's region, so you obviously want to be able to activate this as much as possible, so you run lots of cards in one faction to increase these odds. This deck also includes three copies of Miss Wraith, the key card in this deck, who grants other allied Miss Wraiths everywhere one damage when summoned. We're also running Risen Mists, which is a burst spell which summons Miss Wraith, basically meaning you have three really easy ways to summon this card and activate the effect as many times as possible. Don't worry too much about your units dying, as they will simply fill your finisher pool, which is the Harrowing. The Harrowing allows you to revive the six strongest allies that died this game, and grant some ephemeral. More often than not, you'll probably want to keep this card, the Harrowing, in your opening hand if you already have a smooth curve to reach that late game finish that you want. Elise will sometimes level up, but this is pretty rare as we don't run much spider synergy in this deck, as we're obviously not using Noxus, uh, but she's very basically there as a very good 2-drop. Callista, on the other hand, would much be better to level up in this deck, and to be honest, even once she's leveled up, she can die, uh, and be revived attacking when you cast the Harrowing, which is pretty valuable. It's a nice combo here. If you have a Wraith Caller that has already died, then she's going to re resurrect this, which will in turn summon an additional Miss Wraith. So talk about value here, you're going to be summoning so many cards all at once, your opponent won't be able to deal with it. Basically, a win condition. You can very often get your key cards with Glimpse Beyond and Stalking Shadows, which allow easy ways of drawing. The latter in particular is very useful to start your chain of Wraith Callers. So overall a very solid aggro deck with a very strong finisher indeed. Scouts has been staple since the release of Bilgewater defining what the aggro strategy to beat is. This deck has an incredible curve benefiting from all the great units coming from Demacia. It's basically more Demacia featuring three copies of Misfortune. In patch 1.12, the playstyle of this deck has not changed much, but seems to have success due to midrange doing well in the current meta. Scout still holds its own with all the new rising art types, and it feels like it's been around forever. We see new versions of the Scout stick with Grand Plaza popping up, but funnily enough, we see that the old version without it is actually doing better in win rates. On the Mulligan, you always want to keep Misfortune and Quinn as those are key cards in the deck but it's also important to have your 1-drops, Fleet Feather Tracker in particular, so you can also swap your Quinn for a Lucian if you feel Lucian suits your playstyle better, so a little bit of flexibility here. You want to level up Misfortune as fast as possible, which is always great if you want to attack with your scouts, so don't worry about killing your scouts, because basically you just need to get those attack rounds in as much as possible. You also have a lot of ways to generate value thanks to your tricks. Rangers resolve to counter AoEs and get value trades on wide blocks. Uh, and you've also got single combat to remove their key cards, often getting a value trade by doing that. 
There's also repost as a way to shield from removal and deal bonus damage. And finally back to back which is amazing if casted on your scout units as they benefit from double the amount for that obviously they're getting two attacks so double the bonus. Fiora Shen is primarily a Damasia deck which also features 13 cards from Iona. It's a mid-range deck which takes advantage of two keywords, Barrier and Challenger. So in other words, revolves around very simple combat where you're doing favourable fights and protecting your units. It's a fairly expensive deck featuring 5 epic cards. Value and flexibility are the keywords with this deck. Take as many value trades as possible which is very easy with challenges such as Screeching Dragon and Fiora. Screeching Dragon is a great common card from the last expansion and Fiora can simply act as a cheap free power challenger card here. Try to give them barrier with cards like Shen and Riposte. Shen gives a supported ally barrier this round and Riposte gives an ally free damage and barrier this round as well. There are also lots of tricks to take advantage and punish your opponent with like single combat and sharp sight. Note they both involve combat to kind of fit in theme with the deck. Single combat obviously allows a favourable fight, and sharp sight makes sure you're buffed enough to kill over a key unit or survive a key fight. If value doesn't win you the game, you always have the Fiora win condition, which is easily achievable with all the protection barrier cards you have in this deck, including Iona cards such as Spirit's Refuge, so overall a very solid deck fitting most playstyles and players. Time Crunch Sereka features cards from Buildover and Targon. It's a control deck with surprisingly low average mana cost, with all cards costing 4 or less and 25 cards costing a crazy 2 or less. It's a fairly expensive deck featuring 6 epics, including 3 copies of the Star Spring Landmark. It's a very even split between followers and spells in this deck. The deck has several options to go in for the win. Pure value is generated by Sereka with immense card draw on her leveled up card which basically allows you to draw a card for the first time you heal a card each turn, which is basically going to be happening most turns. It also great value comes from Tom Kent removing a unit per turn, whilst you constantly heal him with other cards in the deck. Another win condition is your landmark, Star Spring Finisher, which is obviously one of the flashy finishers in the game. At the end of each round, it heals all your damaged allies by one, and once you've healed a total of 22 damage using any of your cards, you simply win the game. It is a combo deck at its core, but it has some control strategies to face aggro strategies, mainly Broadback Protector, providing both synergies to self-damaging cards to also have targets to heal, as well as keeping your Nexus healthy and kind of controlling the deck, as well as being an okay blocker with its 7 health. You also have lots of tools to protect your combo pieces. These tools include the four burst spells, Bastion, Astral Protection, Sunblessed Vigor, and Guided Touch, overall showing what a reliable deck it is. Watch out though, it will often lose the early game, but if you can get through this, it's pretty much unstoppable. This is Discard Aggro, a deck you definitely recognise from previous deck lists. It features cards from Piltover and Zorn and Noxus and features three different champions, Teemo, Draven and Jinx. You can include two or any three of the combination here. The average mana cost is very low with 23 cards costing two or less and 14 costing one or less. The most expensive card in the deck is Augmented Experimenter. The deck plan is quite simple. Against slow decks, try to finish your opponent as early as possible before they get their end game. Against aggro or mid-range decks, you can try and win the race against them to see who can finish faster, or you can go for the value approach granted by the leveled up Jinx. Of course, you need to first draw her and then level her up. As the name suggests, the deck is all around discarding, so cards which can be both discard and draw are very desirable, such as Zornai Urchin and Rummage. The deck has a lot of options, smart plays, and therefore is a very skill-based deck. First of all, it's always important to know when to discard a card and what ones you should be discarding altogether. For example, there are obvious discard targets such as Flame Chompers, Jewelry Rig and Vision and these are pretty straightforward what to discards. As for the when to discard a card, Jewelry Rig can be useful to summon a blocker or attack at burst speed, either punishing their open attack or to go in for the kill. 
The same goes for discarding flame chompers at burst speed, although it is much more useful to remove a big blocker so that your other units can basically go in and do what they need to do. Vision should be used to go in for the kill and take your opponent off guard, or to complete trades. This can almost be a win condition in some situations. With the new addition of survival skills, discard aggro seems to be getting a lot of love from Riot at the moment, and continues to be one of the best spots in the meta. Even if this list doesn't run survival skills, I would still suggest experimenting with it. Ezreal Draven is a deck featuring cards from Piltover and Zorn, and Noxus. It features a very balanced mix of spells and followers and has a very low average mana cost with all but two copies of Captain Farron costing four or less mana. It's relatively expensive featuring five epic cards. The core idea of this deck is to get your Captain Farron out as fast as possible and finish the game with him. To accomplish this goal you need to do three things. Draw him, survive and deal a little bit of damage before he comes onto the board. To accomplish the draw part, we have the so-called discard package. Discard to draw cards like Sump Dredger and Rummage are fantastic draw tools, which unfortunately would not really increase your hand size, but basically quickly cycle through your deck faster to get the cards you need. That's where Draven, Chompwomp and Ballistic Bot come in. By generating cards which are not as very useful, you can use them as basically easy discard targets and replace them with more valuable cards. To survive, you have lots and lots of control tools, like Mystic Shot and Thermogenic Beam. Use these to take out your opponent's key cards. On top of that, all the units from the discard package are pretty good blockers too. Ezreal can be involved in your game plan, which also helps on the control side, giving you additional Mystic Shots. Finish off by summoning Captain Farron and using his Overwhelm and the Decimates he generates to quickly finish off your opponent. Nightfall aggro consists of cards from Targon and Shadow Isles and has a very typically aggro deck mana theme with lots of the cards obviously costing not very much. Uh, apart from the Cygnus, the Moonstalker, all of them cost 4 or less. It's actually quite a budget deck with 21 commons and only one epic card. The deck features two Nightfall champions, Diana and Nocturne. Nightfall aggro is like an evergreen in the meta and continues to have a very strong run weight. This deck is very aggressive, but it is somewhat of a strange place. You usually start the first turns off by passing and banking mana, only to unleash a ton of nightfall threats later. It's important to keep your nightfall activators, such as Lunari Dustbringer and Solari Soldier. Stalking Shadows and Fading Memories are two additional nightfall activators, and Fading Memories is by far the strongest one in this deck. Even if you don't play the allies you copied, which obviously can be another nightfall activator, the zero mana nightfall trigger is insane for this deck. Uh, my top tip would obviously be using fading memories on a nightfall activator so you get an additional one uh, at that, and obviously a low cost one as well would be ideal. There are times where you'll go first, and even if you have a one drop, you could be passive by not playing, and this will translate to basically more nightfall triggers later on. Uh, obviously these effects are way more devastating than normal effects on cards because of the nightfall full claws. For example, Crescent Guardian can deal an extra 2 damage to support his Overwhelm effect, and Cygnus the Moonstalker gives himself and an ally elusive uh, the round he's summoned. Diana can remove one attacking unit per turn with her quick attack and challenger, whilst Nocturne can be used more as a kind of finisher combined with other cheap units to make all the blocking units unable to basically block due to fearsome, and basically deliver a, a, an unblockable one shot, obviously when you summon a unit your opponent's cards lose one power, so the aim is to get them under three power, um, so they basically can't block you. Even an aggressive deck in Legends of Runeterra should run a bit of burn, and this role is filmed by Doom Beast and Unspeakable Horror. Doom Beast simply drains two from the opponent's nexus when summoned with Nightfall, and Unspeakable Horror drains one from anything and creates a random non-champion Nightfall card when activated. This is Go Hard Shadow Isles Buildwater featuring Elise and Twisted Fate. It's pretty much a combo deck and it has low average mana cost with all but 3 cards costing 4 or less mana. It's actually quite an expensive deck to build with 6 epics and 6 champions. 
actually started out as a meme deck, but it's actually become a solid meta deck uh, recently, and it's actually looking pretty good with the latest expansion as well. Even with the insane nerf to pack your bags, increasing its total cost by five times, this has been obviously not ever seen before on Legend of Minterra, uh, we still see this deck being very high in the current meta with its viability of a concept, but this is what we feel, me and Bomber feel that the main problem is down to Zap Sprayfin, as we said in our last patch prediction notes, so this is where this deck is going to continue to do well in the current patch. This deck is a pretty unique concept featuring the new KDA card, Go Hard. It's a slow spell that drains one from a unit and shuffles two identical copies into your deck. Once cast three times, it transforms into a very OP Pack Your Bags, which I'll discuss later. The aim of this deck is to play a standard control Shadow Isles playstyle or focus on the Go Hard card mechanic. You want to keep drawing cards to get the magic free as quickly as possible through Twisted Fate's blue card or build wall to draw cards like Salvage. From that simple idea, the deck builds itself. You have control tiles from Shadow Isles such as Vengeance and Go Hard itself. Use Vengeance to take out key units and Go Hard to drain your opponent three times before going into that big combo piece I discussed earlier. Pack your bags. This deals five to all enemies and the opposing Nexus. The rest of the cards are mainly there for curve purposes, and your main plan is either to level up Twisted Fate or go for the Go Hard plan. Definitely a fun deck to play and having quite a successful time at the moment. So this is Lucian Hecarim, and the deck features cards from Damasia and the Shadow Isles. It actually has a very balanced mix between followers and spells, and features the landmark the Grand Plaza which it revolves around. It's actually a fairly expensive deck with a total of 6 epic cards. Bomber TV was the pioneer of this deck and he actually started out with Lucian Callista, uh, but still thinks that this version of the Shadow Isles Damasia deck is by far superior. This deck is very aggressive and takes full advantage of ephemerals. The optimal plan would be to start off with Bark Beast, then pass on turn 2 or go for Lucian. These are the two cards you're really going to be looking for in your opening hand. If you went for the pass, you can easily cast Onslaught of the Shadows or Haunted Relic later on from turn 3 onwards. Both of these cards summon multiple ephemeral cards, which are obviously great for dealing quick aggro damage for obviously very little mana. Hopefully you'll have Grand Plaza on turn 3 to spread the buffs onto these units summoned by these spells just mentioned, otherwise there's no point casting them quite yet. The ideal situation is Grand Plaza will buff your ephemeral cards and give them all challenger, so they can easily take out your opponent's key cards. As obviously most decks have the Grand Plaza, it's obviously going to be the key card in this deck, and it really will make this deck come, to come together, so you need to really be looking out for this, and obviously having it in your opening hand if possible. Later on, hopefully you would have attacked with lots of ephemerals, and Hecarim will basically be levelling up and be your finisher. If that's not enough, you can also revive him with the Rekindler, and usually this will basically be game over for your opponent. A leveled up Lucian could also do very well early on, and most of this is obviously done by sacrificing Senna with a card like Glimpse Beyond, or simply letting the Ephemerals die and letting his kind of death counter tally up the, the old traditional way. With Lucian leveled up on your board, try to cast Relentless Pursuit on your opponent's turn to ensure that one of your units dies. Then trigger the leveled up Lucian's ability to attack one more time, obviously you're going to get another rally here. So this can be really devastating, but it's obviously very reliant on the Grand Plaza. But if you can pull it off, it basically means you've won the game. Here is another deck you'll definitely recognise. It's Pirate Aggro featuring cards from Noxus and Bilgewater. It's an aggro deck with a very mix of mana cost with several cards costing all the different mana costs from 1 to 5. It's quite an expensive deck to build with 8 epic cards in total. I'll be honest, I thought we weren't going to see this deck again at this position in the list, but here we are. This is obviously Pirate Aggro again, and it's obviously one of the few decks that can compete with Grand Plaza at the moment, as your basically plan is to end the game early against Go Hard, also an Ezreal Draven as well. So this is the exact deck list that Bomber TV has been using to climb in Masters at the moment, so check out his video for more in-depth guide and gameplay showing off how to use this deck at its best. The power cards here are Misfortune and Gangplank. 
Even if Miss Fortune was struggle to level up, she's here just a consistent way basically to level up Gangplank and make your board much more threatening on your attacking turns. Gangplank can then end the game with, against wide boards and therefore making aggro mirror matches quite easy with this deck. This deck wants to develop a board early on and you can do this with a very quick start to the game with burn cards such as Liebling Saturateur and Jagged Butcher. Afterwards, as a lot of ways to end the game with burn with units like Imperial Demolitionist or Jack the Winner. Jack the Winner creates a Sleep with the Fishes each round which deals 2 to an ally to deal 2 to the opposing Nexus. You also have Zap Spray Finn which will be able to draw you a Noxin for Vore, always as this is your only spell card with 3 or less mana and this is obviously a fantastic card in this deck which can be very aggressive. If you reach late dame you can quickly close the game with Captain Farron and Decimate Using the overwhelming Captain Farron and the pure blood damage from Decimate will quickly reduce your opposing Nexus to zero. So overall this is a pretty solid deck and a very fast one too, so if you want to rank up quickly this is definitely an option I recommend. And there we go guys, it feels great to be back on one of these types of videos. Overall I think Riot should be willing to shake up the meta a little bit, otherwise the game risk going a bit stale, especially with huge pauses between patches. I'm sorry I guess to have this little mini rant, but I think the reason why we're not seeing too many cards change in these top 10 lists lately is because the meta itself is not changing as much at the moment. The data presented here is analysed by Bomber TV using MOBA Analytics. He's a Masters tier player with a background in game theory and game design. He took the most winning art types into Master tier, excluding ones with small play rates, analysed their key properties on why they are so strong. Link to his channel is in a pinned comment and in the card above. What do you think the best deck is in patch 2.0? I would love to hear in the comments. Up next is best meta decks patch 2.0 looking at the decks currently dominating the meta. Hope to see you there. Please remember to like and subscribe and turn on bell notifications too. See you next time guys.